chapter 6. In it, in it to win it, praise God. All right. In it to win it. Let me give you a uh, preface here, I guess, maybe I could say before I actually get into my time that I count my preaching time, is that um, today, buckle up, okay? Because we've got a lot of ground to cover. I normally don't like doing it this way because you can overwhelm folks with too much material, and I understand that. But we're talking about a, not only an exciting subject, but a very extensive one. And I wanted to cram as much in as I could in a short amount of time. So basically, and I'm going to try to reserve myself so that I make the point, give the scripture, move you know, move in, get it said, get it done, and move out. We'll see if that's possible. Ephesians chapter 6. Stand yet again, if you would, please. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be going to verse 16 and 17. And here we're going to read uh, this about, you know, there's six pieces of the armor... And uh, the last three, he says, taking them. So beginning there at verse 16 and 17. Everybody have it? We've read it for several weeks. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you all shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and here we go, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You may be seated. We're talking about, of course, in it to win it, this spiritual battle warfare that each and every one of us are, <coughs> excuse me, engaged in on a very daily basis. And here the Apostle Paul, we, for the last few weeks, have been talking about the armor. We've been talking about the particular articles that is in the armor. And the Apostle Paul was very familiar with the Roman soldier, <coughs> <laughs> Not sure what's going on here. He lists six particular pieces. And then he, in the spiritual sense, he ascribes a spiritual virtue to them. So that just as the... Roman soldier could be covered and protected and uh, be given victory by way of being having on this armor that you and I, if we would be covered and apply the spiritual virtues and utilize them, then we too can be victorious in our spiritual battle that we're engaged in. As we come today without a whole lot of going back into the past, I want to jump right in to the very final, the sixth and the last uh, pieces of the armor that he mentions. And we've just read here that it is the sword of the Lord. It is the sword of the Spirit, which he says is the Word of God. Let me give you just a couple of uh, contrasts between this particular article of the armor as it relates to the previous five. You see, the previous five, in one way or the other, they really were placed or they were taken up and they were there to render protection 
for a particular area of the body or as the, uh, the uh, shield, uh, the entire body. But you see, we see here then that with, with the sword that it is, yeah, it's there for protection, but it's the only piece of the armor that can be used not only in defense, but also on the offense. Of course, you can use the sword in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and you can use it defensively as somebody comes at you with another sword, or as they come with a whatever they use, those things, those war hammers and those war clubs with the spikes on them. And so you could defend and, you know, kind of cast those aside. So it could be used defensively, but on the other side, it could be used offensively because the Bible talks about a two-edged sword, and it was it was sharpened, razor sharp on both sides, so that when you swung it, uh, you didn't have to reload. In other words, you whatever which way, backhand or or forehand, if you went that way, then you could just turn it and, and come back the other way so it was uh, two edged and so it was very sharp at the point as well and so obviously you can see that on the offense uh, that it could pierce it could cut that uh, it could uh, obviously kill and destroy by virtue of that and as we have said that in this battle as we go back to our assignment of what God wants us to do he not only wants us to stand our ground against the enemy but he wants us to go on the offense and he wants us to fight offensively against the darkness of hell and this kingdom of darkness. So he wants us, us to get on the offense. But here, here's the thing that I like about the word of God that is kind of different in the sword from the rest of the articles that we've mentioned. As we've already said, they were applied to a certain area of the body for protection. But the sword of the Spirit is not just for protection of certain areas or all of the areas of our body. It's not just to defend us and in our battle against the attacks of the devil but it actually enables us to attack the devil himself. So we're not just the fiery darts and all of the other things that he's throwing us, but we can get on the offense, and I mean we can take it to the devil personally with the Word of God and the sword. I want us to go back, and uh, if you're turning in your Bible, we're going to start off there and spend quite a bit of time. But I want to go back to Matthew chapter 4, and I want to give you an example of this, and I love this. This is exciting stuff about that we can go on the attack of the devil himself, not just with his particular attacks, particular ones against us. But, but you know that in whether it's Matthew or whether Luke, in both chapters 4, it talks about the temptation of Christ. Forty days the Lord is in the wilderness. He's fasting. And the devil is coming with every temptation known in the man except the gospel writers, they only record the last three. And I, I don't believe that that was the only three temptations. I believe that the Bible says Jesus was tempted in every fashion, in every way that you and I will ever be. But the only difference with him is that he was tempted, but he did not sin. He did not succumb. And you and I, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not, uh, we're not able to do that. 
and uh, we can certainly live above sin because of what he's able to help us with, with now. But what I want us to see here, that he focuses upon these three. But where I want to go is to the very end of that particular episode. And uh, I don't know, I'm probably in the way. But he, but he said down here in verse 10, after all this was over, he said, this said Jesus unto him, this is King James, get you hence, Satan. And then here's the weapon of the word of God, for it is written. And we know that he prefaced every rebuke and answer to the devil with it is written. It is written, all three. But down here, he said, get your hints, Satan. It is written. And then you come down to verse 11. Then the devil leaves him. You're not shouting yet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, when he came to the end, he's not only coming against the attacks of the devil, but he said, devil, let me give you a rich gold eyes and simple translation. Devil, get out of here. Amen. Devil, I'm finished with you. You may think you are the one that has been on the offensive here. And, and you may think that you're gaining ground here. But, but hey, I'm telling you, get out of here. Can I tell you, church, that when the devil begins to oppress us in our minds, in our spirits, and in our hearts, whether it be the living word, Jesus himself, or whether it be the written word. Say, devil, it is written. And in the name of Jesus, you get out of here and you leave me alone and you leave my family alone. I'm telling you, through the power of the word of God, we're not able to just deal with the enemy's attacks, but with the enemy himself. Himself. As we get into the, into the Word of God, about the Word of God, there are several things here. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The first thing I want to do is I want to stay right here in Matthew chapter 4. And I want us to look at what I call the picture. If you want to see the Word of God in action against the enemy, there's no better picture than the see that with the Lord Jesus. Christ. And you're going to find it here in this, in this temptation where he comes to him. So the first thing is the picture of the Savior. You see, folks, one of the greatest reasons that Jesus came to this earth, he said, I didn't just come to tell you what to do, but I've come to show you how to do it. The Lord is our example in everything that he did. And he did it right. He did it perfect. He did it well. And so when, when we're fighting the devil and utilizing the word of God, there's no greater picture, portrait that is in the Bible that we can find than Jesus himself. So the picture of the Savior. Now I've already alluded to this, but here Jesus, and, and, and if you go to the, to the beginning of the chapter, it said he was led there by the Spirit. You know, we think we get in a wilderness experience. Why in the world? Uh, by here, we would never think that the Spirit of God would lead us there. But he was led into the wilderness 40 days, fasting. He's tired, he's weary, coming to the end. And the devil offers these last three temptations. The first one, as if, you know, as we saw, the first one he said, you know, basically you're hungry, turn this stone into bread. Physically speaking, if you've done any fasting at all, and I've never done anything uh, 40 days, but I know folks that have, and you know, you go 40 days, you can go 40 days, but then is when true hunger really begins to take place. That's when your body begins to feed upon itself to try to survive. And that's the danger part. So the Lord was in a very physically, he's human, think of that now. And so for 40 days he's weary, he's tired. But notice where he gained his strength from. To 
to combat the devil. Church, I'm telling you, you can be on the flat of your back and you cannot uh, hardly have enough strength to whisper your name, but in your mind you can use the sword <laughs> as effectively as if you were a young man again and, and, uh, or a young woman again and standing there strong. So uh, that's why we've got to use these not in our own strength. So, so the Lord physically was, was weary and it's tired. And he said, do you see these stones? Turn them in the bread. And then we remember Jesus said, a devil, it is written, utilizing the sword of the word of the Lord. Uh, you know, you're, you're not, you're not going to. You're not going to live by bread alone, but by every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I'm not going to give every one of the answers. The second one, the Bible said that he uh, took him up on the pinnacle of the temple and a high place and basically said, jump off. And we'll see why he did that, told him that. And then the third one, he said that took him up on a high mountain and showed him all of the nations. And he said, if you bow down and worship me right here, I'll give all these to you. And let me tell you, as far as the world, the worldly system, the, the devil had them. Are you listening to me? As far as the worldly system... As the world, as the, the world is called, when you read in the Bible the world, it doesn't mean just this uh, globe, uh, but it means this worldly system that is anti-God and anti-Christ. And, and he said, if you'll do it, and, and he said, it is written, it is written each time. Now what I want us to do, I want us to go back very quickly to the postcard of John in 1 John and chapter 2 and verse 16. Here John says something very interesting. And you know it. He said, for all that is in the world, and he lists these things. Here they are. There's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it's of this worldly anti-God system. In other words, what John is saying, that every sin that is known unto man comes under one of these headings. The lust of the flesh is our human fleshly appetites with the predominant one being sexual. How much sexual sin perversion do we see in the day we live in? The second one, he said, is the lust of the eyes. That is where you want more and more and more. You, you know, you may... Well, I could get into a lot of things, but, but, but it's stuff. The first one is... Is I like to, you know, put it so we can remember. The first one has to do with sex, but it has to do with food, any type of appetite uh, of the flesh, abnormal appetite against the Word of God appetite. Uh, but then, uh, then the second one is, let's see, I just stuff. You, you're never satisfied with the stuff you have. You want something bigger and better. And when you have that for a little bit, uh, it doesn't satisfy you anymore. So you want something more and more and more. So it's this it's lust. It's, it's this uh, in where you cannot satisfy insatiable lust for more money, uh, monetary things is what you're after. And then the last one is the pride of life. And so you can see once again how sex and then how money people do anything to get those two things. To have more stuff. They'll kill, they'll steal, they'll destroy. And so what he's saying is that everything that is of the world, this worldly system, all of these sins, it comes under one of these. And then the last one is the pride of life. 
And that is where you want the notoriety. You, you want the publicity. And you want, when, when you go somewhere, that people just fall all over you. Oh, 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 look who you are and what you've done and, and so on and so forth. And the, to, be, to have the ego stroked and, and to really think that you're somebody. I tell you what, you can see where a lot of people kill, steal, and destroy, and cheat, and everything else to lift themselves up in politics. And it's all about them. It's nothing about the people. All right, I said I wasn't going to get sidetracked. So here we go. Here's these three lusts of the flesh. Do you see how they coincide with the last three temptations that was given of Christ? The very first one, he said, it was the lust of the flesh, the appetite of the flesh. You're hungry. Turn this rock into stone. Then the second one, uh, he took him up on the, and said, throw yourself off. Why would he have done that? Because of the lust or, or for the pride of life. You see, Jesus, you're just getting started in your ministry. You want people to know who you are? Climb up to the highest part of the temple and jump off. And you're, you know, you're going to be fine. You're going to be well. And then when everybody sees it that you're not hurt, they're going to say, wow, wow, wow. Wow. And I mean, your name's going to get out there all across the Jerusalem times. You're going to be the front cover uh, in all, every news story. Uh, we're going to get the word out. So it's the pride of life. And then the last one where you said, if you bow down to me and I'll give you the uh, all of these nations and all of these kingdoms, uh, uh, that's the lust of the, of the eyes. More. How could you have more than having the whole earth and everything that is in them? But here's what I'm coming down to. That when the devil brought every kind of temptation knowing the man against the devil or against Jesus, the devil against Jesus, Jesus used the word of God. Use the sword to overcome. And church, we can too. How was the Lord able to do that? Oh, it must have been because he's God. No, it wasn't because he was God. He's man. And he was doing this in, the, uh, in that sense of being totally human. But the reason he was able to do it, not because he was God, but because uh, he was man, but he knew how to utilize the sword and he understood the word of God and he knew it and he knew how to apply it against not only the temptations of the devil, but the devil himself. I wish I would have, uh, a scripture just kind of came to mind. I wish I'd have had um, Ken to bring this one up. But if you have your Bibles, you can go over to the book of Luke chapter 4, which tells the same story. And in verse 13, here's the way Luke finishes it up. He said, when the devil had finished all temptations... Now you might think, okay, he's finished with all the temptations. Luke chapter 4, 13. See it? And when he finished all the temptations. It doesn't mean that when he had finished all that he was going to come against the Lord that day. But it means when he had given all that he had. So when the devil gave all he had against the Lord, the Lord rose victoriously above every one of them because of the Word of God. The next thing I want us to see is not only the picture of the Savior utilizing the Word of God, but this is the Word of God. Let's talk about the power of the Scriptures. And here's where it's endless. The powers. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, 
For the Word of God is alive, is quick and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword. This book, by virtue of the words, has power in it. It's not how demonstrative the pastor or the speaker may be that generates that power. That has nothing to do with it. It's, it's the words is where the power comes from. And because it's, it's God's word. <clears throat> so jumping right in, I want to give you several things. And, and like I said, this doesn't scratch the surface of all of the power of the Word of God. But the first one, why is the Word of God a power, powerful? Is because of its perfection and then I also, its permanence. I put those together, but, but really you could, uh, you could have them apart from each other. They, 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 it is powerful here because of the perfection. And when I talk about the perfection of, I'm talking about the Word of God is true. Jesus said in John 17, 17, your word is truth, or sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. There's another passage of Scripture that I didn't give to Kent, but it's in... Romans 3 and 4 and it says let God be true and every man a liar we know all too well there's all kind of philosophies ideologies there's all kind of of belief systems that are out there and you know we want to give equal grounding and I'm, I'm not a not against folks uh, living and believing however they want to and and I'm not against that at all but the point of the matter is I have a firm belief that this is all that is truth yes. this is all that is truth and I know that they won't let you go to the Bible as a reference point in a debate if you're debating somebody. But still the matter of it is, this is our belief system. We always go back that if there's conflict between what man says, and I don't care if he has a PhD or what God says, I'm going to take what God says every time. Because the Word of God is true. It's perfect. The Bible says God cannot lie. Did you notice it did not say he will not lie, but it says he cannot lie. In other words, he cannot because it's totally against his essence and his nature of who he is. If he ever lied, he would cease to be God. So he cannot lie. And not only then are, are these, these truths, not only are they perfect, but they are also permanent. This was not just for the early disciples. This was not just for the Jews, but especially in the New Testament. And as we see all that, that has taken place, these truths was not just in our nation back, uh, you know, 1776. This wasn't just for the morals and the standards in the 40s and the 50s uh, in this nation. But these truths are still relevant and right for you and me in 2019. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 30 or 24 and 35, he said that heaven and earth is going to pass away, but my word shall never pass away. It's permanent. But not only is the Word of God, you see the power in it because it is perfect, it is, it is true, it is permanent, and it never goes away. Nobody can ever destroy it. It's God's standard. But I want us to also notice the production of. 
The Word of God is able to produce so many things. That's why it's powerful. So the power of the Scripture is perfection, performance, because it's production. If you want to see the power of the Word of God, go back to Genesis 1. Because of its creative power. You're going to see that in each case, if you and I are going to build something, and you know, that's what I like about building and that type of thing. You measure, you cut, and you take materials, and uh, you have a blueprint, or you have an idea of what you're going to do, and, and then you're able to take those materials and build it into something one. But can I tell you that when God said, I'm going to create all this, He didn't have any building materials that He utilized. Because you see, God created something out of nothing. He had nothing to start with. And I, I just gave the first scripture, if you go there to Genesis 1 and 3, but, but that's the first. You're going to read this over and over and over. Every time, every day that something new was created, except the seventh day that God rested. But on every other day it said, And God said... And God said, let there be whatever there was, and there was. As some old preacher said, and I liked it, he said, you know, yeah, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. You know, God said, let there be light, and bang, instantaneously, there was light. And God said, let there be whatever, and bang, it's intentionally. It just appears. It's, it's the power of God's creative scriptures, His Word. And, and, and let me just say that God can take His Word, and I believe He can bring creative things into your life. I believe recreative things in your body, recreative things in your mind. God can, uh, it, because it, it has that creative power. But not only because of the production of creativity, but, but the Bible, the Word of God, has power to enable us to conquer. We've already talked about this, but let's go to Revelation chapter 19. And here is where Jesus is coming back uh, to set up his kingdom. He's going to fight all of the enemies and all the nations led by the Antichrist. That's all of the enemies of God in this epic battle of Armageddon. And the Lord comes back riding on this white stallion out of heaven. And you and I are riding our horses, Christians that have, that have gone to be with the Lord. We're riding on horses behind him. And John gives us a little bit of an insight of who this conqueror is. But if you want to see what this conqueror is going to use to conquer the nations... The Bible tells us very plainly in verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp, what? Sword. And notice mouth because of his word, likening the word to the sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And then you go down to verse 21, uh, where in between there he talks about the Antichrist and the false prophet of that day being thrown into the lake of fire. And then he says the remnant, in other words, that were left over from that, they were slain. But how, how, how was this victory brought about? With the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And somebody say amen. amen. You see, the word of God conquering power. And the reason that I like this 
so much here. I, I didn't have Ken to bring it up, but if you have your Bibles open, you know that that is at the end of chapter 19. And as you flip over to chapter 20, the first thing you're going to read about is an angel's going to come and take the devil and he's going to bind him for a thousand years and then later is going to throw him into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. But you see, it's by the word of the Lord. Ah, you want to see the difference? Jesus submitted himself to this, this temptation because he had to go through that to purchase your and my salvation. So he had to permit himself to be tempted back in Matthew chapter 4. But let me tell you, there's coming a day when the Lord says, enough is enough. And I've already secured your salvation. And I'm coming back here to take care of this mess. And devil, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna handle you as it were with kid gloves uh, because I had to submit myself to that. But now I come as the conqueror of who I am and out of my mouth destruction of the enemies of God. But even the devil himself. You know in warfare and I don't know if they still do this or not. I, I, I know that in the Civil War and so on and so forth, and when somebody surrendered, you know, they wanted to surrender to the main guy of the opposition. They didn't, they thought it was under themselves to surrender to give their sword to somebody that was lower. If I'm going to surrender, I want to surrender to the, to the top guy. And Jesus says, devil, I'm not even fooling with you. One of my subordinates is going to take care of you. Conquering power. Of, oh my. Conviction power. John 16, 18. In the Holy Spirit, and he's, he speaks of the Spirit, but you see the Word and the Spirit work together. The, the Word of God tells us what we're doing wrong, and then the Spirit of God brings about that conviction in our heart of what it is. He, he, the Spirit of God makes us aware of it. So the Spirit of God and the Word of God is going to bring convicting power upon our life. Convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But let me tell you something. He not only convicts, the Word of God not only convicts the world, but even as Christians, that's how we grow in grace. You know, you read something, you read something, you say, wow, I know I'm a Christian, but bam, that hit me right between the eyes. I need to, I need to get this, get this straightened out in my life. I, I want to live according to the Word of God. And, and then even after you're saved and you do something stupid, you probably know it instantaneously, but if you don't, the Spirit of God is going to let you know through the Word of God that this is not right. Counselor. The Word of God is powerful because it is our counselor. If we had uh, an eternity, you could go through Psalm 119, which is the longest book in the Bible. But do you know Psalm 119 is entirely about the Word of God? As he begins from the very beginning, he calls it the statutes of God, the commandments of God, the uh, precepts of God, uh, uh, the ordinances of God, uh, the judgments of God. He calls, calls the Word of God all these things, and then he launches in to all of this that the Word of God is able to do that. And that's why, like in Psalm 119, 24, he says there that, that uh, now my mind's... Uh, uh, my mind's... Okay, testimonies. It's down there on the bottom. Your testimonies also are my delight and my... What? Counselors. The Word of God is my counselor. The Word of God is my counselor. 
Have you ever been in a situation you don't know where to go? You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. You don't know who to turn to. You want to you get some counsel. You want somebody. The Bible says that, uh, you know, that's a good thing in Proverbs that you get counsel and, uh, you know, pray about it and all of that. But I'm telling you, there's sometimes we just don't know what. But the Word of God is our greatest, one of our greatest counselors. We know the Spirit of God is too, but, but the Word of God, we hold it in our hands. We can, we can flip through it any time that we want to. We can read it earnestly any time we want to. So it is the Word of God that is our counselor. How awesome is that? Spirit of God comfort. Psalm 119, 52. Psalm 119.52 I remembered your judgments. I remembered your words of old, O Lord. And when I remembered the word, what happened? It comforted me. I talk to people all the time that are discouraged, distressed, or going through whatever situations with, with just issues of fear and doubt. And one of the main things that I tell them, fill your mind with the Scriptures. Yes. And all Scripture is good, but particularly those that apply to your situation. Confidence is another power of the Word of God. It brings faith and confidence. Romans chapter 10 and there you'll find in verse 17, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. How does faith come? How does confidence come? If you're if the devil's trying to breed as much doubt and fear and angst in your mind and you're trying to, trying to get that out of there and not think on those things and, and uh, whatever, and you're trying to build faith in your heart, how do you do that? Get into the Word. Get into the Word. In fact, I had another subpoint: the promises. Not only its perfection, its performance, the production of the Word of God. We've just gone through several of these, but the promises of the Lord. But, but that kind of coincides with our last point there of faith, of faith. The promises. Church, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what you're going through, and you may think nobody else in the world has ever gone through what I'm going through. It doesn't matter how remote you think your situation is. There are promises in scriptures and the Word of God that deal exactly with what you're going through. And that's how you build faith in your heart. That's, that's, and that's why you need to know the Word of God. That's why it's so important to read it yourself and to be in church as much and faithful as you can is because, uh, you know, if, if this is what we're going to use when Jesus was able to come against the devil, he just didn't say it is written, but he had a specific passage of Scripture that he had in mind that he was going to use to combat against the devil. You can't just say, devil, it is written. I don't know what's written, but it is written. But you see, you need to know what it is. Jesus was able to overcome the devil, not because he held it in his hand and brought it to church with him, but because he had it in his heart. And so must we. But this last weapon, and I am going to close here. Sorry about this monstrosity of an outline. Uh, if I was back in Bible college, I would get an F. But I'm 63 years old and I can do what I want to do. So 
I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I did it. I still respect all my teachers, professors. <laughs> the last thing that I, I want us to see about this, because did you notice how Paul put it, the sword, and he didn't just say the sword, which is the word, but he said it's the sword of the Spirit. So you can't take the Spirit away. That's why I said, when you see the Spirit working, He works in, in, in coordination with the Word of God. The two of them work together. But He said, it's the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword that is empowered by the Spirit. It is the sword that that is able to accomplish what it does through the operation of the Spirit also. And just to give you a sampling and closing of that, of how the two go together, the Word of God and the Spirit. And church, that's... that's That's why I pray. That, that, that's my heartbeat. I, I, I'm, an, I'm an old pastor and I may not know how to pastor anymore, but I still know that if you take the Word and the Spirit out, you have nothing. And we've got to have the move of the Holy Spirit, the unction of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to live our lives, preach and teach our children the uncompromising, inspired Word of God. And that leads me to my first point of the Spirit. Do you realize that Peter says in 1 Peter in chapter 2, in verse 21, he said, he's talking about prophecies in the past, but where did these old, old prophets, where did Jeremiah and Isaiah and even the minor prophets and, and all of them, how did they speak as they spoke? It wasn't themselves. But where did this word come from? They spoke as what? They were moved by the Holy Spirit as they were moved. And so, yeah, it was them speaking, but it was the Holy Spirit working through them and giving them the words to say. And so it's not their words, but it is God's Word. And the reason we put so much preeminence upon the Word of God is because it is the inspired infallible, incomparable Word of God. It's not only inspired, but the Holy, Holy Spirit inspired it, but the Holy Spirit's going to help us to interpret it. Do you know you read through this Bible and you try to grasp it on your own education, on your own mental capabilities, and you're not going to get anywhere with it. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and there is he makes, makes reference in verse 14. He's talking about that the natural man, he, can, he cannot receive the things of the Lord. They're foolishness unto him. And he goes on to say, they, they, you know, he, he's just not going to understand them. But he said the only way that he can understand them, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It's a Holy Spirit that interprets this word for us and gives us understanding as we read it or as we hear it. The two working hand in hand. And the last one, once we recognize this is God's word, then once we read it and we begin to understand it, then the last thing, it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to incorporate what we've read and interpreted into our individual lives.
I started out in this journey a long time ago, honey, I'm finished. Oh my. Some of you longer than I. But it's the Word of God. Church, if we're going to be victorious, we've got to have this Praise God. sword. Yes. This word. When I get in here, I, I, I just can't help but say we've got to keep on preaching. Word of God. Why would we want to preach a feel-good message? Just to make people feel good? That's not going to change anything. Father in heaven, amazing because it comes from you, it's inspired of you. And Lord, when we begin to think about these stories, true stories of the picture and the portrait of the Savior and the devil there in that wilderness scenario, Lord, when we begin to just go through and look at the power of the Word of God, of what it's able to do, what it's able to produce, of what it's able to accomplish in our lives, of what it's able to build faith and help and, and counsel us and lead us and guide us. And, and Lord, that your Word is light into my path. And on and on we could go of these scriptures. Why would we not want to delve into the Word and know as much of it as we can? So Lord, here at First Assembly in Mascuda, Illinois, we're going to be soldiers of the Lord and we're going to put on this whole armor of God and we're going to take up this sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God and Lord we're going to stand our ground and get on the offense and we're going to see by the help of the Holy Spirit a move of God not only in our individual lives but in the life of this community Help us, Lord. We understand our frailty. We understand that we cannot do it without you. And Lord, I know that there are some things that we've got to roll with the punches. We've got to become relevant with society. I understand all of that, but Lord, never at the expense of the Word of God. If you're here today, would you just like to stand and would you...